Good morning. Good to see all of your smiling faces. Everybody having a good week? Good, good, good. Well, you know, if you're not having a good week, you know you can change it, don't you? Just by the words that you speak. Amen. Last week, we taught on the Easter story because last Sunday was Easter. So, you know, there is a lot to the Easter story. And we don't have enough time in one service to cover the whole Easter story. Matter of fact, it would take us weeks to cover uh, all of the Easter story. So each year, you, you, you know, I try to cover particular segments of the Easter story. And last week, I thought on something or a perspective of the Easter story that I haven't talked on or, or haven't preached on in a long time. So I encourage you, if you haven't listened to last Sunday's sermon, that you go back and listen to it because it is kind of a uh, precursor to what we're going to be talking about today. We're going to just kind of continue with the Easter story today. Uh, one of the things that uh, that we look at, and, and, and rightly so, it's, there, it's extremely important. When we look at the Easter story, we look at the death, the crucifixion of the Lord Jesus. We look at... Um, We look at the days that were leading up to the crucifixion. We look at the trials of Jesus. We look at the scourging. We look at the, then the crucifixion. But what we don't talk about a whole lot is the time that was spent in the three days and three nights that he was in hell. And that's what we talked about last week. He was then gloriously resurrected, and we talked about what happened after he was resurrected, when he had to put his blood on the mercy seat in heaven. Now, I want to pick up the story today with what all happened as a result of that. When he did all, when that was accomplished, what all that provided for us. So I want you to... Well, actually, I don't have any idea where I want you to turn. I got about eight different places I want to go right now. Let's, um, I guess I want you to go ahead and find Acts chapter 1. <clears throat> I'll get there eventually. You have to bear with me, but at some point I'll, I'll get to Acts chapter 1. But one of the things that I, never mind, forget what I said. You're going to need to be turning to me with these, these places. I want you to turn with me to Matthew chapter 27. A verse of scripture that you may not even be familiar is in your Bible because we don't emphasize this a whole lot during the Easter story, but it is in there. So Matthew chapter 27 and verse 52, I want you to notice something that happens here. When Jesus was crucified, when he was on the cross, there is an event that is in Matthew's gospel that we don't, uh, we don't draw out very often, but it, it is very significant. Matthew chapter 27 and verse 52 says, And the graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep. Now remember, fallen asleep is a euphemism for they died. They were raised. What? And many of the bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of the graves after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. Why don't we talk about that during the Easter story? I mean, don't you think that is a significant event? Jesus is crucified, and when he dies, the veil in the temple is rent from top to bottom. Now, that depending on who you're talking to, that veil was anywhere from three to six inches thick. It was, it was not curtains like you have in your living room. A person wouldn't have been able to just take it and rip it. It was rent from top to bottom, the Bible says. Now, this next part is my opinion. It is my opinion that when that, those curtains, I mean, we, we use the illustration, now, now God and man could be together because of this, and, and that's true. But my opinion is, that when that veil was rent in two, that there was a great deception that was now made public. 
And that deception being, the Ark of the Covenant wasn't in there. The Ark of the Covenant had been taken away when the kingdoms divided. And we don't, find, we don't hear a whole lot more about the Ark of the Covenant more in our Bible. There, there's a period of time in our Bible that we stop hearing about the Ark of the Covenant. Many people believe that it was taken away uh, to protect it. And so, but they still kept going through their ritual, and, and so this was exposing the priesthood for what had, had become deceiving the people. That's my opinion. It is not my opinion that the graves were open and Old Testament saints came out because it says that that happened. Now, do you, you understand, here the Messiah has come in on what we celebrate as Palm Sunday. They're excited. They're singing praise to, to, to the Savior, to the Christ, to the Son of David. They're excited. They're excited that they're about to be out from under Roman rule. But just a few days later, he's killed. And some very strange things happened around his death, and that begins to spread. And you have these people. Out. Now, I do want you to notice here in Matthew uh, 27, it says, in coming out of the graves after his resurrection. So it, it implies that when Jesus came up out of hell, he brought them with him. But it doesn't say that they left yet. Remember when Jesus came up out of hell, Mary was there and he said, don't touch me. I have not yet ascended to my father. And we talked about that last week. The reason is he had not yet cleansed the furniture, the utensils in the Holy of Holies in heaven. That still had to be cleansed. So he, he, was, he was in between when she came to the tomb. So all of this is probably the most important event this, this week, the most important series of events in all of human history. But my brother and sister, it doesn't end here. The, 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 this is not the end of it. We're going to look today at why all of this happened. There was a reason for it. It wasn't just for sin to be paid. Now listen, that's really important. Okay? That's a really important element in the Easter story. But that's not all of it. There's more to it. So after Jesus is resurrected, he ascends to heaven, and then he comes back to the earth, Acts chapter 1 tells us. Matter, now I want you to go to Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1 tells us that he comes back to the earth, and that he's on here for 40 days in verse 3. It says, To whom he also presented himself alive after his suffering by many infallible proofs, being seen by them during 40 days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom. So he is being seen of his disciples. 1 Corinthians 15, 6, you don't have to turn there, but you can footnote it in your Bible. 1 Corinthians 15, 6 says he appeared to over 500 people. In your Bible, it says that. So he appeared to over 500 people. He talked here for 40 days. See, we think that we somehow have in our mind that Jesus was crucified, raised from the dead, he went to heaven, stayed there, and then 50 days later we have the day of Pentecost, and so everybody was wandering around for a month and a half wondering what was going on. That's not what happened. Jesus, after he had cleansed, the temple in heaven was back on the earth, and he was going around with many infallible proofs. In other words, this is not hearsay. This is not happenstance. This is not myth. Many infallible proofs that he was here going around teaching, and he was teaching on things pertaining to the kingdom. The things that he was, was teaching is, now that this has happened, this is what happens to you. This is, the kingdom of God is now able to come to the earth through you. Now, the kingdom of God physically is not here yet. That's what the millennial reign is about. But the kingdom of God can come to the earth because it's in you. 
So he's teaching that. And, and I believe he taught the same, the, the same thing to everybody that he saw. I also, it's my opinion that, you know, and remember over in Luke chapter 4, it says when, when he got up to preach, it was given to him the scroll, and he turned in the scroll. He would have actually turned to Isaiah chapter 61. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor. Remember when he read it? I believe that he taught that everywhere he went. I believe that was the first sermon that he taught everywhere that he went. So I, when he's going around here, after he's been resurrected, he's telling people, he's explaining to them, now that this has happened, now that the price is, has been paid, there's going to be some things that are available to you. So he's teaching them how that's going to work. And those things are really, really important. Now I want you to look with me here in verse 4. Being assembled together with him, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you have heard from me. So Jesus told him, he said, I, I've told you about the promise of the Father. You've heard me tell you about this, Now I want you to wait. Now I want you to pay very close attention to verse 5. For John truly baptized with water. But you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days hence, or not many days from now. Do you remember we have several places in our about Luke chapter 3, around verse 16, talks about how John the Baptist said that there's coming one after me whose sandals I'm not worthy to tie, who will baptize you with the Holy Ghost and fire. Do you remember that in your Bible? That's, it's actually in each of the Gospels. So John said, there's coming one after me that's going to baptize you with fire. Jesus right here, this is written in red in your Bible. He says, John baptized with water, but, draw a line, you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Now, there are people that believe, and I, boy, I know I'm going to get comments this week. There are many people that believe that you have to be baptized in water to go to heaven. And they use verses of Scripture in the Great Commission when Jesus says, those that believe and are baptized will be saved. Your, your, your Bible says that. That's accurate. Well, right here Jesus said, John baptized with water, but in a few days from now, you're going to be baptized with the Holy Ghost. Well, John is the one that said, Holy Ghost and fire. Now, I want to remind you, do you, you remember over in uh, Ephesians chapter 4, you don't have to turn there. Ephesians chapter 4, starting in verse 1, it, 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 the Apostle Paul is going through, and he's talking about the things that we have in Christ. And in verse 5, he tells us that, that there's one Lord, one faith, and one baptism. <clears throat> I'll say that again. He said there's one Lord, not many. There's one faith, and there's one baptism. Now, if I have to choose one baptism, guess which one I'm choosing? Am I going to choose John's baptism with water, or am I going to choose Jesus' baptism with the Holy Ghost and fire? I mean, if one of them is going to get you saved, and you've got to be baptized to be saved, guess which one I'm choosing? I'm choosing Jesus' baptism and not John's out of the Old Testament, out of the Old Covenant. You've got to be careful. Whenever you attach something to salvation, whenever you attach a work to salvation, you've missed it. Whenever you take the grace of God and attach legalism, that's religion. Matter of fact, Paul's very clear in Ephesians what it takes for you to get saved. And Y'all pray for me. I intend to get to that verse of Scripture today. Maybe. No promises at this point. Now I want to ask you a question. I know there are those of you in here and, and those of you out there that uh, how many of you have ever been in the military? Raise your hand for me. Okay. All right. How many of you in law enforcement? 
Okay? A very similar expression is used in both of those two. When somebody goes into combat for the first time, basic training and further training try as best that it can to prepare you for your first time of actual combat. And many people will tell you after that first time that there's nothing that really could have compared. There's nothing that could have compared you for being in that situation. Military or law enforcement. Now your training helps you. It helps you react. They, they, they try to train you so that, you, that when that pressure is on, you fall back to your training. But the intensity of what's going on, you can't duplicate in drills. And have you ever heard the expression in a situation like that? Well, it was their baptism of fire. Now, when we use that expression, we don't think water baptism, do we? Now, was there literal fire? No, it's an expression that we use. It was their baptism of fire. We even use that today. What we, the, the error that we make is whenever we look in our Bible and we see the word baptized, we automatically think water. There is a baptism of water. There is also a baptism of fire. They are not the same thing. The baptism of water was Old Testament cleansing that pointed to the cleansing of the Lord Jesus' blood. Okay? So he tells them that this event is about to happen. And he said, and I want you to wait in Jerusalem. And so we pick it up here in Acts chapter 1, verse 7. He said to them, it is not for you to know that... Okay, they ask him um, in verse 6. They ask him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, it's not for you to know the time or the season for the, which the Father has put in his own authority. Verse 8. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. So he says, you're going to receive power. Now that word power there is the Greek word dunamis. This is the miracle working dynamic power of God. It's the anointing of God that was on Jesus that enabled him to do the miracles that you see in the Bible. He says, I want you to go to Jerusalem and wait there until you have received power to be witnesses for me. Now, here again, we think that was a long period of time. All right. Pentecost is 50 days after Passover. So, after Pas Jesus was crucified on Passover. So, there's three days of it right there that he is in the grave. So, that leaves us 47 days. He's resurrected and then comes back. So, now we're down to 46 days. And then he's here for 40 days. So, that only leaves five or six days left, right? So it wasn't like he left them for a month and a half sitting in that upper room. It was less than a week that they were there praying. They would have been accustomed to doing things like this at festivals, at, at, at feasts. This would not have been unusual for them to wait that long there in Jerusalem. So you know what happened on the day of Pentecost. The Spirit of God came in that room. There were 120 of them. Did I mention to you that He appeared to over 500 people? Do you think that there were people that were wondering what was going on in Jerusalem when they saw Old Testament saints walking the street? Now, I believe, this is my opinion, I believe that those Old Testament saints were walking the streets 
preaching the gospel because the Bible tells us that Jesus, when he went to hell, preached the gospel to the captives. So I believe that they, were down, they heard the preaching of the gospel from the Lord Jesus. When, when he is raised from the dead, he brings them with him. He leads captivity captive. He takes them out of, I know this really messes up your, your doctrine on purgatory. And I'm sorry. But purgatory's not there anymore. Purgatory, Abraham's bosom, paradise, all refer to the same place. Abraham's bosom was a place that the Old Testament saints went to when they died, looking forward to the coming of the Lord. They didn't go to the pit of hell. When Jesus turned to the thief on the cross and said, Today you will be with me in paradise, there are people that say, Well, see, he went to heaven that day. No, he didn't. He went to paradise. He went to Abraham's bosom. After the price had been paid that we talked about last week, Jesus preaches the gospel to these captives. And then your Bible very clearly says, and they came out. And they're walking the streets, I believe, for 40 days, preaching the gospel in the streets of Jerusalem. Jesus told his disciples, if you recall in one place, to meet him in Galilee. So I believe Jesus was up in Galilee preaching up there. You know, it wouldn't surprise me if Jesus laid this plan out when they were down there in Abraham's bosom. He said, all right, y'all get together here. I want, I want you group right here. I want you to go here. And this group right here, I want you to go here. And this group right here, I want you to go here. And I want you to tell them about the kingdom of God. That's what he said he was preaching, right? So the Bible tells us here, right after he's told them to go wait, look at verse 9. Now when he had spoken these things while they watched, he was taken up and a cloud received him out of their sight. Now then, most of the time in your Bible, when you see the word cloud, it is talking about a large group of people. In the book of Revelation, when it, it refers to cloud several times, it's obvious it's talking about a large group of people. Do you remember over in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1, seeing how we are compassed about with such a great cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside the sin that so easily, the weight and the sin which so easily besets us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. You and I were the joy that was set before him. That's, that's what enabled him to do, endure the cross. Despising the shame and then being seated at the right hand of the throne of God. That's a powerful passage of Scripture there. And it's talking about seeing that we are compassed about with such a great cloud of witnesses. Well, when Jesus was received up into the cloud, I believe it was the Old Testament saints that had been released on here. He took them with him. When he left, they all went up, and it was the way that they expressed that was in a cloud. That's scriptural to interpret that way. So they go wait in Jerusalem, and the day of Pentecost fully comes. And the power of God hits that place. The Spirit of the living God, the power, the anointing of the Lord Jesus. Now listen, you understand, this is the same Spirit of God that moved on the waters in Genesis chapter 1. This is the same Spirit of God that just went to hell and got Jesus out of there. And I, and I want to remind you of something. I, the tone or, or the illustration in our Bible changes after this point when it starts describing power. Before this, the Bible talks about power and the power of creation. After this, the Bible talks about the power that raised Christ from the dead. Because apparently the Apostle Paul believed that the greatest release of power 
that had occurred in the history of man was the power that it took to raise Jesus from the dead. Now listen, there had been other people that had been raised from the dead. We find in the Old Testament there were people that had been raised from the dead. That was not what was unusual. The thing that was unusual is this is the first person that had gone from spiritual life to spiritual death and then raised to spiritual life. He Remember, we looked last... Jesus was the firstborn from the dead. There had been others that had been raised from the dead. Why was he the firstborn? Because he was the first one that was raised from spiritual death to spiritual life. Another place that says he was the firstborn of, firstborn of many brethren. We are the many brethren. So that power that went in there to get him, you have to understand, the devil has put together this plan for over 4,000 years and thinks he's won. And the Spirit of God comes into that place to raise Christ from the dead. Every devil in hell is trying to prevent that from happening. When God said, light be, there was nothing that resisted him. The only thing that resisted him was dark. Dark doesn't have any resistance. Do you know how easy it is to overcome dark? Flip on a light switch. I mean, have you ever noticed when, it, when a room is dark and you turn on the light, there's not this battle that goes on? The light, oh, and then the dark fights back, oh, and you have to sit there and wait and wait and wait and wait, and finally the light wins. No. When you turn on the light, light instantly dispels darkness. How much power does darkness have? Zero, none, nada. So when God looked out in the darkness and said, Light be, there was no resistance. Light be, it just came into existence. Bam. What he literally said was, Me be in that. That's literally what he said. So, when that power raised Christ from the dead, it was the greatest release of power that we find recorded in our Bible. That's significant. And I'm going to show you why it is significant to you. Turn with me to Ephesians chapter 2. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 4. Ah, uh, no, 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 I don't want to do that. Back up into chapter 1, verse 17. Because this is all in context. This is all the same thing. We separate it. I, I've preached sermons on Ephesians 2, 4 through 8. I, I've preached sermons on Ephesians 1, 17 through 23. So how about if we just kind of put them together today? Is that okay? Ephesians 1, 17. If you'll recall, this, that should sound familiar to you. Because... If you've ever come to me for counseling and you've ever said, Pastor, I just don't understand how to pray for this. There's a 99% chance that I've told you, turn in your Bible. You know, up in my office, I have a green Bible. How many of you have seen the green Bible? Okay. I have a green Bible in my office and the green Bible is just like this Bible. And the reason that I did that years ago is because not everybody that I'm talking to has spiritual knowledge like you do. There are sometimes, I know this is a shock to you, but there are some times that I talk to people that don't know the Bible as well as you do. So to keep them from getting embarrassed, I have the same Bible sitting there uh, with them that's my Bible. So when I tell them to turn to a scripture, like I said, listen, I want you to look up in your Bible there, Ephesians chapter 1. And verse 17. As a matter of fact, if you'll 
turn to page 1028, that's where it is. And so that way we're on the same page. That's pretty smart, I think. That way they don't, they don't spend 10 minutes fumbling through their Bible trying to find a particular verse of Scripture, and then it embarrasses them, and now then they're embarrassed, and, and so we just, so to keep that from happening, the green Bible in my office is just like this Bible. So I'll tell you when you ask, Pastor, I don't know how to pray for this. Go to Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 17. This is one of the prayers. We call them the Ephesians prayer. The other one's over in chapter 3. This is a prayer not only that you pray for other people, but that you can pray for him. This is the prayer that has the verse in it that the eyes of their understanding be enlightened. Boy, we misuse that. You know what we use that verse of Scripture for? That's when somebody has a difference of opinion from you, and you say, Lord, I just want you to, I just pray right now, that you open the eyes of their understanding, and, and then you mean by that, so that they can see that I'm right. That is not what that's talking about. That's talking about the eyes of your understanding. I pray that prayer over me. I continually want the eyes of my understanding to be enlightened. I don't use it as a weapon that other people see things the way that I see. You know, I don't know if I, I, I haven't said this in a while. Do you know that my goal is not to get you to believe the way that I believe? That's not my goal. My goal is to show you in the Word and to teach you in the Word so that you can make decisions on your own. What I want you to do is I want you to have a consistent belief system so that you can have faith in it and so that that faith will rise in your heart and enable you to walk in victory in every area of your life. That's what I want for you. But most people, and I'm talking about good Christian people, go to church and everything, they have so many questions and, and there are so many things that don't make sense to them that their faith won't operate because your faith only operates where the will of God is known and you have to remove the question marks so that you know what the will of God is in a particular area. So I'm, I, my goal every week is not to convince you to believe the way that I believe. I want you to look at the Bible, see what the Bible says, and then come to your own decision. If you make the right decision, you'll believe the way that I believe. Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 17. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, so he says in verse 16, I do not cease to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers, and this is what I pray. Verse 17. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you the spirit of wisdom, revelation, and the knowledge of him. Now that's a good thing to pray, isn't it? That's a good thing to pray for you. That's a good thing to pray for your spouse. That's a good thing to pray for your children. That's a good thing to pray for your employer. That's a good thing to pray. That the eyes of your understanding be enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of your calling. That's what he's asking that the eyes of your understanding be enlightened to, is to understand what your calling is. What are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints? He also wants you to have a complete understanding of what your inheritance is. You know, you just don't get all of that. You don't understand all of that when you get saved. You're just glad you're not going to hell. But what he's praying, remember, the book of Ephesians is what the big boys eat. The book of Ephesians is written to mature Believers, the book of Ephesians is a very mature, deep spiritual book. First and second Corinthians, written to babies. He says so. That's just baby stuff. That's just basic, fundamental stuff. The book of Ephesians, deep. Pastor, I would like to get into the deep things of God. Well, go read the book of Ephesians. Read the book of Ephesians one time a day for a week, and then you'll be a deep thinker after you do. So this is what the big boy, this is a mature church pastored by Timothy. 
that you'll understand what your inheritance is. Verse 19, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power? Here's that word power, dunamis, dynamite, the miracle working power of God. He is praying that the eyes of your understanding be enlightened so that you'll understand what the exceeding greatness of his power towards us who believe according to the working of his mighty power which he worked in Christ when when he raised him from the dead all right hang on hang on we got we got we got to start that verse 19 and what is he's praying that the eyes of your understanding being light that you understand what your inheritance is that you understand what your calling is that you understand what is the exceeding greatness of His power towards us who believe. Which He worked in Christ when He raised Him from the dead and seated Him at His right hand in heavenly places, far above principality, power, might, dominion, and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the age to come. And He's put all things under His feet and gave Him to be the head over all things through the church which is the body, the fullness of Him who fills all and all. And you He made alive who were dead in trespasses, in which you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the Spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we once conducted ourselves according to the lust of the flesh. Verse 4, But God who is rich in mercy because of His great love, with which He loved us even when we were dead in trespasses, he made us alive together with Christ and raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ. That is what Easter is about. That is the Easter story. Did you notice, do you understand the Apostle Paul didn't write this letter in chapter and verse? It continues through just like we read. And we're still not through. He said, I pray for you. I cease not to make mention of you in my prayers. And the thing that I pray for you is that the eyes of your understanding are enlightened to this. Did you catch what all was going on there? Did you catch in verse 20, which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the... That, that this exceeding great power towards us, it's the same power that raised Christ from the dead. That power he has extended to us. He, he put Jesus far above all principality and power and might and dominion. In verse 6 of chapter 2, he tells you how Jesus was exalted. Then in verse 6, and he's raised us up together. Now I want to ask you a question. Do I have any school teachers in here? Okay, all right, all right. I'm not going to put you on the spot. You can <laughs> See, it's always funny, teachers. When you ask questions in your class, you expect your students to raise their hand. But whenever I ask it, I usually get one of these. I know who you are. So I want to ask y'all this question. Raised us up together. Is that past tense, present tense, or future tense? That's past tense, isn't it? He's made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So we've been raised. And in the ages to come, He might show us the exceeding riches of His grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. Now then, verse 8. This, is all, this all goes together. For by grace you have been saved through faith. If you don't mind, can I insert something here that we've just read? For by grace you have been saved through faith, and now this power that raised Christ from the dead is available to you. You have been saved by grace through faith. 
The same power that raised Jesus from the dead has saved you. Can you understand why the Apostle Paul wants them to understand this? My brother and sister, this will change the way you go through life. When you realize that the same power that raised Christ from the dead is available to you. As a matter of fact, that same power that raised Christ from the dead is in you. It's what, it's what got you born again. That's what happened on the day of Pentecost. That power, the same power that was on Jesus, the same power that raised Him from the dead, that same power came on the church. And we have ding-dings that are teaching that stuff's passed away. Don't you know the devil sits back in his recliner and just laughs at that? The devil's tool against you is to deceive you. He cannot overpower you. You have the greater one on the inside of you. He cannot go toe-to-toe -to -toe with you. Are you listening to me? The devil cannot go toe-to-toe -to -toe with you when you're operating in that power. He knows it. So what does he try to get you to do? Set that power aside. He wants to fight you without that power. Now, it doesn't matter whether you're saved or not. If you're born again, now you're going to heaven, okay? But you can be born again and lay that power aside and the devil will eat your lunch. Now, you'll still go to heaven. You'll just get there all banged up. He does not want you walking as an overcomer in victory while you're here on this earth. He doesn't want you influencing other people. He doesn't want you when there's a pandemic out there that it doesn't come nigh you. He wants you operating in the same fear that everybody else operates in. Listen, we're not denying that things happen. We're not denying that there's pandemics, that there's sickness, that there's calamity, that there's financial problems. We're not denying that. What we're saying is the greater one is on the inside of us that has overcome all of that. Now, if you don't call on that, then you're just going to go the way of the world. You're just going to go like everybody else. Still go to heaven. But he will eat your lunch while you're here. So if you were him, wouldn't you try to talk people out of using that power? Yes. So it's gotten into our churches. It's gotten into religious thinking. Well, you see, brother, the early church needed that. We don't need that for today. Have you lost your mind? Do you think after the first century the devil quit? My goodness, he's more active today than he was in the first century. There are attack, there are unspeakable things going on today that they hadn't even thought of back in the first century. And people think we don't need that for today? My goodness, if there is ever a time in the history of mankind you need a baptism of fire in the Holy Ghost to walk in the power of the living God, it's now. Well, but you have to be water baptized, though, don't you? If it makes you feel... But by the way, can I say something here? This may prevent some nasty comments from coming in. We do believe in water baptism. It is an ordinance of this church. Water baptism has a place in the church. It is a, a, an event. It is a public profession of your faith. Uh, you are announcing through that the, the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus. It is symbolic. It is not required for you to go to heaven. Hey, 
the baptism of fire is not required for you to go to heaven. But if you don't have it, you're going to lead a miserable life while you're here. The devil's just going to use you as, as, as his punching bag. I don't know if y'all are aware of this, but this is good preaching. Where was I? I was in Ephesians somewhere, wasn't I? For by grace you've been saved through faith, and that not of yourself. It is the gift of God. I mean, he says right there in verse 9, not of works. Is water baptism a work? Yes. A bunch of other things we use as works. The works follow the new birth. When you are the, the, the new birth is a free gift to you when you call upon it, when you recognize it, when you receive. <coughs> you understand when you're given a gift, you don't have that gift until you receive it. Right? The gift, I mean, think of Christmas time. You can have gifts under the tree, and that's really nice that you've got those gifts over there, and they sure look really nice all wrapped up and everything. But that gift doesn't do you any good until you receive it and open it and look at it and play with it and smell it and, you know, stuff like that. That's the same thing that's true with salvation. It, it's really good. It's already been provided for you. It's under the tree, but you have to receive it. And you have to open it. And when you open that salvation, there's all kinds of neat stuff in there. Inside that salvation, when you open that present of salvation up, you know what's in there? A voucher that says the price of sin in your life has been paid. You no longer owe that debt. Now, you know, if that's the only thing that was in there, that'd be good. But that's not the only thing in there. You know something else that's in there? You have been delivered from all sickness and disease on this planet. You know what else is in there? All of your needs have been met according to His riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Everything that's in there is summed up in John 10.10. 10. Life and life abundantly. Now you know, if all you want to do is get the voucher out that pays for your sin, that's fine. And you want to leave that other stuff alone? That's okay. You can still go to heaven. This is what the Apostle Paul is talking about when he says, to walk out your salvation with fear and trembling. This is what he's praying here, is that the eyes of your understanding are enlightened, that you understand all of what you've got. Who doesn't want you to understand all of what you've got? The enemy. You're saved by grace through faith, that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any one should boast. For we are His workmanship, created in Christ for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. I want you to turn to one more verse. And I'm going to, for those of you keeping count, this will be my first closing. How many closings do we have today? I don't know. But you know when I get a sip of water, I can go for at least another 45 minutes. Y'all relax, I'm not going to do it. <clears throat> Just in case you're wondering, is this anywhere else in the Bible? Oh, yes, 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 it is. Acts chapter, or Romans chapter 8. I want to go back and read the whole chapter because it's so good. But I'm not going to for the second time. Let's start in verse 10 to kind of get back up and get a little bit of a running start. And if Christ is in you, that means if you're saved. Remember, Christ is not Jesus' last name. Christ means the anointing, the power. By the way, that comes automatically when you make Jesus Lord of your life. The two go together. And if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin, but 
The Spirit is life because of righteousness. Verse 11. If you don't have this underlined in your Bible, you need to. But if the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, He who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal body through His Spirit who dwells in you. The same power that raised Christ from the dead, King James Bible says, quickens your mortal body. That's what you have available to you. My brother and sister, listen. You are never powerless. You always have enough power to get through any situation that the enemy would bring against you. But you know who decides whether you access that power and you walk through that? You do. We do. How do we exercise that authority? By the words that we speak. Your voice when it gives voice to what we're talking about today, activates that power operating in your life. Walking around, wringing your hands, going, Oh God, oh God, things are so bad. What are we going to do? What are we going to do, God? What, oh, I just don't know what we're going to do. Everybody's getting sick. Everybody's getting laid off. Gas prices are going through the roof. Have you seen groceries yet, Lord? We bought five items the other day, $134. It's just so bad down here. <clears throat> My brother and sister, that's not going to get you through anything. I don't care what prices go to. Because my lifestyle is not based on that. My lifestyle is based on God will meet all of my need according to His riches and glory. Not according to our economy. God will supply all of my need according to His riches and glory by Christ. He will supply all of your need according to His riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Amen? That same power that raised Christ from the dead has raised you up and made you alive unto God. Able to walk in power, dominion, and authority on this planet. To able to access the same power, the same anointing that raised Christ from the dead. Amen? Amen. We'll stop there for today. As you can tell, I am not through, but we're going to stop. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Well, I thank you for joining us today. My desire for you is that God's richest and best are yours. And remember, there is victory in Jesus. As I tithe and give offerings, I am believing the Lord for vision and direction, jobs and better jobs, raises and bonuses, benefits, sales and commissions, favorable settlements, estates and inheritances, interest and income, rebates and returns, discounts and dividends, checks in the mail, gifts and surprises, finding money, bills paid off, bills decreased, blessings and increase. Thank you, Lord, for meeting all my financial needs, that I may have more than enough to give into the kingdom of God, and promote the gospel of Jesus Christ. And if you agree with that, say amen.